My life has been an utter failure. I was the first Asian to bring home the Nobel Prize in the scientific field. I thought I would build true science in our country. <laughs> All we have now is a legion of camp followers of the West. There can be no salvation, no real advance at this rate. He was one of India's greatest physicists, the acknowledged leader of the early scientific movement in this country. Nobel laureate, he is renowned for a discovery that bears his name, the Raman effect. Why then, in the twilight of his life, does he look back, not with pride and satisfaction, but with pain? He was a man of strong convictions and innovative ideas many of which are as relevant to Indian science today as they were at the turn of the century. This film is not just about the life of a famous man now no longer with us, but also a tribute to his genius. This is a film on the legacy of Sir C. V. Ram. The young Raman was curious by nature. He wanted to know more about everything that he saw and heard. For the rest of his life, this curiosity, combined with an inherent love for nature, drove him to study her many facets. Even at the age of 82, he was exploring new vistas as actively as he did as a child. For him, science had always been the key to understanding the workings of the world around him. Fascinated, he mastered such classics as Garnot's physics. There is a story that late one night, despite high fever, he refused to sleep till his father, a science lecturer, fetched a laden jar from his college and showed him how it worked. See, a large amount of charge is accumulated at the bottom you connect this to the electrode, it gets discharged. Apriya, there's a spark. Hmm. Raman was born near Tiruchirappalli in Tamil Nadu in 1888. From there the family moved to the coastal town of Vishakapatnam when he was four years old. The sun, the sea, nature in all its primordial beauty here must have first stirred the young boy. He began to ask questions. His father encouraged his curiosity. As Raman's thirst for knowledge grew, he was spurred to take science up seriously in later years. When light falls normally on a rectangular aperture, one gets a series of dark and bright bands symmetrically arranged around the slit's image. What if I hold the aperture inclined to the incident light? The diffraction bands are sensibly symmetrical when the incidence is moderate and asymmetrical when it approaches 90 degrees. The minima in this case are of course given by the usual equation. A cos theta minus cos phi is equal to plus minus n lambda. Hmm. <laughs> uh, what are you doing now, young man? Sir, I'm trying to work out a new method of measuring the surface tension of liquids. Mm, new method? Why? Because by the usual method, either the drop is not steady or it falls down in the middle of the observation. So I thought if I could photograph the drop profile, it would be easier to calculate the surface tension. Uh-huh. Sounds ingenious. Carry on. Oh, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Jones, sir. Oh, one moment, please. Yes? Uh, some time ago I'd given you a paper of mine for comments. Uh, a paper? 
Yes, on unsymmetrical diffraction bands when the incident light is oblique. Really? Ah, yes. Perhaps you did. Well, it is nothing much to go by. Nothing at all. Carry on with your work. Raman was not discouraged by Professor Jones's lack of interest. Instead, he took the initiative and sent his paper to one of the most respected scientific journals, the Philosophical Magazine in London. And it is to his credit that he had enough confidence in his first independent experiment to be able to send his findings to such a reputed magazine. For then, as now, education was a means towards a degree Students were not encouraged to think independently or to use their initiative. Colleges in India did not have a tradition of research. Which, of course, brings us to a very fundamental question. What is research? It is only seeking after knowledge. Knowledge is not dead and enshrined in books, but living, growing. It is the attempt to discover new facts and new relationships between known facts. A university is not a university if this is not understood. You must be one of the seekers, else you'll be left behind. Raman's scientific makeup is uh, very fascinating. He was the product of an educational system that did not attach much importance either to science or to curiosity, which of course is very important if one wants to be a scientist. Spurred largely by books, he absorbed all the, by himself, all the important points about science, after Newton that is. And if one might borrow a phrase from Newton, one could say that Raman stood on the shoulders of giants like Newton himself, Faraday, Ampere, Maxwell, Lord Kelvin, and of course Lord Rayleigh, who inspired him quite a lot. Way back. In 1907, a handful of Indians were still struggling to create a niche for themselves in areas dominated by the British. There was no scope for a scientific career, as there is now in post-independent India. So Raman decided to do the next best thing, join the government, topping the entrance examination to the Financial Civil Service. He was appointed Assistant Accountant General, the youngest ever to be so appointed. This was a period of great change in his life, for he also happened to meet his future bride, Loka Sundari. The couple were married and on Raman's posting moved to the bustling capital of the Raj, Calcutta. But Raman had not lost his interest in research and one day at 210 Bo Bazar Street he stumbled upon the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. I would like to meet the person in charge. Ashun, come in. What did you say your name was? I will write it down. C. Venkatraman. I'm a government servant. The assistant accountant general, in fact. But I'm interested in continuing to do my research in my spare time. Original investigation in optics and acoustics. Well, come with me. You see, we do have a laboratory. But it's so decrepit. You know why? Because in the 30 years since it was built, no one ever came to me and said he wanted to do research. The epitome of science in our country. This place was built with many hopes by my uncle, Mahindrala Sirkar, a staunch nationalist. He believed that science can change people's way of thinking. He started lectures, 
They became very popular, but no one was interested in anything beyond that. I would like to do my research here. You would? But only after office hours. I can't let the timings clash. Of course, of course. Ashu Babu will be here to help you. But you will want something. An honorarium? Our funds are low. And I'm afraid I can't afford to pay you very much. You needn't worry. This is all that I need. I'll start tomorrow evening. Thank you, Mr. Raman. Thank you. All these years we have been waiting for someone like you. Raman started his work in acoustics with the study of violin strings. He continued the work of Helmholtz and established the whole theory on a firm footing. Afterwards, he also investigated how the quality of the tone of the violin string is determined by the point pressure, point speed and the point at which he bumps. He continued the work further into other Indian musical instruments. The most notable piece of work he did was on the study of the vibrations of the Indian drums. The Mridangam and Tabula are rather unique instruments in that they are the only two, inst only two drums in the entire world which can produce a group of harmonic overtones. Raman discovered that these drums give harmonic overtones by the particular loading to which the, his drums are subjected. For example, the fundamental mode of vibration comes when the drum head vibrates as a whole and the second harmonic comes when the drum head vibrates in two halves, the central line remaining at rest all the time. And the third harmonic comes from this mode of vibration with one nodal circle or two nodal diameters like this one. These two modes can combine to produce a variety of modes of vibration. You see what I mean? Such wonderful tones. Of all the musical instruments, the veena comes closest to resembling the human voice. Really? I've been seriously playing the veena for so many years, and I never realized it. The strange fact is, there is a law in Western science which states that certain overtones just cannot be produced by any musical instruments. But the veena violates it. You know why? All because of this curved bridge whereas Western instruments have flat bridges. How much our ancients knew about acoustics? Do you know something? What? The Germans have asked me for an article. Uh-huh. That's good. Yes. It's just not enough to do research anymore. You must publish the results immediately. So emanated the first research papers from the IACS, 30 years after it had come into existence. During those early years, Raman worked for the most part alone. Even so, the publications poured out. In fact, so fired was Ashu Babu by Raman's enthusiasm that even he wrote a paper for the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And Ashu Babu had never even been to college. Raman's fame began to spread. Not only did he become a source of inspiration to young research scholars like Venkateshwaran, Ganeshan, and of course, K.S. Krishnan, but Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, the Vice-Chancellor of Calcutta University, offered him the Pallet Chair of Physics at the University College of Science. He accepted this post gladly, even though it meant receiving only half the salary that he earned as the Assistant Accountant General.
प्रोफेसर रामन दिस ग्रीन फिल्टर इट्स कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री टू द वायलेट सो इट कट्स ऑफ ऑल द वायलेट कलर पासिंग थ्रू बट वेन आई प्लेस इट हियर इन द पार्ट ऑफ द स्कैटर्ड लाइट द रिजल्ट इज नॉट द सेम दिस अ ट्रैक ऑफ लाइट विजिबल a track of light in spite of a complimentary filter why i don't know i suppose it's a weak fluorescence due to impurities still inside the liquid i'll have to purify it even further hmm what do you think krishnan i don't know I've investigated more than about 60 liquids among them not only water but some alcohols too show the fluorescence quite markedly but what puzzles me is whereas fluorescence is generally unpolarized the scattered light here is polarized hmm I'm beginning to wonder is it fluorescence at all because if it's not fluorescence then it should be scattering because raleigh scattering can be polarized and it would be strong where is the track that we have over here so very feeble could it mean is it not possible that it's not fluorescence at all but altogether something new something different not fluorescence not raleigh scattering Sir, sir, I've just studied the visible radiation excited by ultraviolet light in pure dry glycerin. It's strongly polarized. What? And the track is a brilliant green instead of the usual blue. Green. A change in wavelength and polarized. This definitely cannot be fluorescence. This is something new. Boys, remember, I'd always said there must be an optical analog to the Compton effect. Is this it? You mean when x-rays are scattered by atoms there's a change in frequency exactly just imagine if there's a change in wavelength with the scattering of x-rays i think the same effect can take place with the scattering of visible light but how do we prove it the track that we have is too feeble we should try and make it stronger probably we'll have to use a larger lens and complementary filters krishnan i think you should follow it up i sir yes i think i need somebody who can use the sunlight throughout the day i've got my classes and venkateshwan's busy working so he can only come in part time besides you've stayed away from experimental work for too long not at all healthy for a scientist huh this is marvelous news just wonderful You understand what I mean? The first step taken in the research was to find whether the effect is shown by all liquids. The method of investigation was to use a powerful beam of sunlight from a heliostat concentrated by a 7-inch telescope objective combined with a short focus lens. This was passed through a blue-violet filter and then through the liquid under examination contained in an evacuated bulb and purified by repeated distillation in vacuo. It's true of visible light, sir. It's true of visible light. There's still a track in spite of the complementary filter sir. It's polarized. And there's a change in wavelength. But the links are still missing. How do I How do I show that there is a change in energy or a change in frequency? frequency color the spectrum of course the spectral lines will indicate any change in frequency asha babu arrange for the spectroscope quickly quickly where is krishnan not come today sir religious ceremony in his house It's ready sahab but the sun is setting the light will not be strong enough 
Oh, dash it all. First thing tomorrow morning, huh? Next morning, I could see the spectral lines, but they were not clear. It occurred to me to change the light source, to use a monochromatic light. Ashababu, get me the mercury arc lamp. It's so clear, Krishnan, so very clear. In the blue-green region, there are two sharp lines instead of one. What? Yes. Between the incident line and the new line, there's a distinct dark space. The new line must be of a different frequency. It shows a change of energy. The new line that Raman discovered indicates the amount of energy lost or gained by a photon of light when it interacts with an atom of matter. This in turn tells us a great deal about the atomic and molecular structure of that substance. It was a momentous discovery that paved the way for new research in almost all branches of science. C. V. Raman was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1930. It was a moment of great significance, for not only was it a tribute to the man, it also officially put a country struggling for an identity on the scientific map of the world. The Raman effect provided the last convincing proof regarding the photon concept. The photon concept was proposed by Albert Einstein as early as 1905, but it found little acceptance for nearly two decades. And uh, the Raman effect was one of the discoveries which made it very clear that the photon concept was correct. And it's not surprising, therefore, that Einstein hailed this discovery. It must be realized that Raman did his work with a very feeble, energy-wise, broad source of light. This required long hours of experimentation to collect a single spectrum. With the discovery of the laser, which is an intense, energy-wise, uh, narrow source of light, uh, Raman spectroscopy received a big impetus. Now we could collect a spectrum in a few minutes and with higher accuracy. Today, it is being used to solve important problems, not only in one branch of science like physics, but in many, many branches of science, almost all branches of science, chemistry, biology, material science, earth sciences, and so on. Even on application sites, it is always a part of analytical technique which is used for high technology. For example, in microelectronics, space, uh, nuclear fusion, optoelectronics, you name it. The man was once the centre of scientific activity in India, is now a recluse, perhaps because success inevitably breeds envy. When Raman was appointed to the Palit chair, the impression began to be created that he was a has-been physicist, working on highly dated problems, while a new wave of physics was sweeping the rest of the scientific world. Raman's own nature did not help. His ego had alienated many people. In the years following the Nobel Prize, the resentment against him grew more vocal. It was said that Raman did not understand the significance of his own discovery, that it wasn't even his, that it was Krishnan's. It depends upon the points of, point of view that we take. For example, if we ask ourselves, who was the first person who observed the Raman effect? There is no doubt the first visual observation through a direct vision spectroscope was made by Raman himself. The question is, who took the first recorded Raman spectrum? It was K.S. Krishnan. Raman got the idea that sunlight must be replaced by a mercury arc. 
and Ashubabu, Brahman's famous assistant, and K.S. Krishnan had just the spectrograph, and K.S. Krishnan de developed the film. And so we could say he recorded the first spectrum. But that is not the real point. One should always ask, who got the idea? Who was behind this thing? In 1933, Raman came to Bangalore. He'd been offered the directorship of the Indian Institute of Science. The Institute had never had an Indian director. They had always been British. The Institute had also never had a physics department. Raman set about creating one. Your work has been promising. You should keep it up. You put in a little more effort, and you can go much further. Thank you, sir. You know this Institute needs young blood like yours. It needs to be changed reformed. People in these parts have a joke about the institute. They call it a sanatorium with a few laboratories attached. <laughs> but sir, I think you have changed all that. Naturally. Why should the workshop only carry out repairs? That's gross underutilization. They should be able to fabricate new equipment required by the various departments. And within the departments also. The physical chemistry department should be part of the physics department. The chemists over there will have a much better chance of interacting with colleagues who have similar interests. Oh, there's so much that can be done. You know something? Max Bond is coming. Sir, have you heard from him? Yes. I've received his letter this morning. He's accepted the readership I offered him. Just wait and see, my friend. Things will begin to change for India. No more will our youth have to go abroad to get initiated into research. But as it is, I don't like the practice. The environment over there is so very different, and the conditions here makes them useless here. You know what I feel? If great men like Max Born and Schrodinger were leaving Nazi Germany, they can be provided with a home here. Then perhaps there can be started off a real scientific movement in the country. The renowned physicist Max Born did come to India, and soon Raman strove to make his position permanent. But all Raman's reforms were too sudden. They ultimately led to a major controversy. The problem between C.V. Raman and the council leading to Raman's resignation has many facets. I shall briefly mention four of them. First, Raman was the first Indian director to be appointed. Three Britishers had preceded him. And the British faculty members were rather reluctant to work under Indian director as evidenced by Max Baron's letter to Weberford. Second, Raman has some, had some attitudinal problems. He was an extrovert with a sharp tongue and oftentimes overbearing. He lacked administrative tact, which is so essential for a director. The third aspect, there was no physics department before Raman came. He created it and he equipped it. There were tensions and charges that Raman was building the physics department at the cost of the other uh, departments. The Irvin committee was not all that objective. Its members were prejudiced against uh, Raman. And Raman ultimately tendered his resignation from the post of directorship and continued to work as the head of the department of physics. Having no alternative, Brahman decided to stay on. He continued to do research of a high quality in optics, crystal physics, and ultrasonics, in which the Raman Nath theory is an outstanding piece of work.
but the controversy had left its scars. The problems that Raman faced in his attempts to upgrade the institute were to him representative of larger issues at stake. These included the need to recognize the importance of fundamental science, to manufacture equipment indigenously, and to make universities centers of research. Many Indians before Raman had shared these views, some of which are relevant to us even today. Professor wanted uh, India to be great, uh, a great country doing great science. You must remember that uh, when he did most of his work, we were under the British, and when he got the Nobel Prize, the flag that he sat under was the Union Jack. So he felt very strongly that India should be independent, and independent not only economically and politically, but scientifically. Now in the post-independence era, we have certainly had more money for science, and more opportunities, but somehow our values have got severely eroded. And this is beginning to cost us, although we are hardly conscious of it. Take for example a thing like, a thing like the recent excitement uh, concerning high temperature superconductors. Like all other countries, we have also spent a lot of money on research, which of course is good. But the sad thing is that we have spent a lot of this money for buying equipment from abroad. I mean, equipment to measure electrical resistivity. In 1911, Camerling Ohms discovered superconductivity using his own home-built equipment. And today, roughly eight years later, we are importing such equipment to make the same kind of measurements. And this is exactly the sort of thing that uh, Raman was warning us in those days. Two years before my retirement from the Indian Institute of Science, I started building my own center. I called it the Raman Research Institute. There was no water, no electricity when I first started. Ah, but that didn't make a difference. At least I could do my highly personal research work without any interference. You know what I mean? Like the poet and the painter, the scientist, too, is motivated by an inner, creative urge. Only earlier, I felt I had to prove my findings to others. Eh? If I have seen and understood, I am satisfied. I don't think Raman really discovered anything or added anything to our understanding of, of vision. Um, there are uh, three uh, major uh, tenets of, of the theory of vision or modern theory of vision, uh, with, which, with each one of which Raman seemed to have uh, taken issue and disagreed. He totally uh, ignores what the contemporary knowledge of physiology of vision was. It's what goes on in brain which constitutes perception and you have to, you have to pay attention to that. And yet in his book he pays no attention to that. He, he talks all the time of uh, what happens uh, in the light, in the, in the way light acts, acts on the retina. But he pays no attention and by then actually uh, a fair amount had begun to be known about how uh, information reaching the eye is analyzed by the brain. And really key to understanding the perception of color is in understanding that and how brain analyzes uh, the signals which go from the eye. Uh, so that sort of is, uh, you know, one has, uh, uh, it, it only can evoke in one sense a feeling of sadness that a, a mind like that essentially had decided to cut himself off from what the science, uh, science was. When he made this discovery, he was already 40 years old, and thereafter he was not able to hold his own uh, and keep pace with the new trends, new fashion, and new style. And this shows up clearly in the controversy that he had going with Max Born for many years on a rather technical point concerning the subject of lattice dynamics. It was clear that uh, Raman was partly right, and he was not totally wrong, but yet, the way he made his arguments, people dismissed him and uh, he was uh, forced to uh, obscurity thereafter. 
many people in this generation, of course, suffered an eclipse, but uh, they did not uh, suffer controversy, so one doesn't notice that eclipse. In the case of Raman, unfortunately, the eclipse is very pro prominent because of the controversy. Although certain aspects of Raman's personality and work have been criticized, there is no doubt that he was instrumental in laying the foundations of the entire edifice of Indian science. Apart from physics, he was equally interested in the growth of the other fields. These fields were not to be developed in isolation, but in relation to each other. Science was a living, dynamic whole, and ideas needed to be exchanged. So he created a national forum, the Indian Academy of Sciences. He also wanted science to reach the masses. His popular lectures were always comprehensible and tinged with humor. Children were the future of the nation. To them he wanted to gift the joy of discovery. This then is the legacy of a man who believed in the potential of the Indian mind. What we lack is perhaps courage driving force. We need a spirit of victory, a spirit which will recognize that we, as inheritors of a proud civilization, are entitled to a rightful place on this planet. If that indomitable spirit were to arise, nothing can hold us from achieving our rightful destiny. Raman died on November the 21st 1970, here in Bangalore. He was 82. His death marked the passing of an era in Indian science. A unique memorial marks the spot of his cremation. It is, as he himself would have wished it, this solitary tree. <laughs>